on to our next high renaissance superstar. Michelangelo lived to a ripe old age, and as a result, he complicates our planning, since his later work really, in my view, belongs to the Catholic Counter-Reformation or reaction to the Protestant Reformation. So, I'll return to his dark last judgment when we get to mannerism in Unit 9. Like Leonardo, Michelangelo was an artist who not only reflected, but also transformed his times. Indeed, he's the first Western artist whose biography was published while he was still alive. He was also the first artist whose art made him, in modern terms, a multimillionaire. Like Leonardo, Michelangelo's roots lie in the early Renaissance, and more specifically in the Florence of Lorenzo de' Medici. He was born in a town near Florence, and he apprenticed to Girlandaio. Remember that other Last Supper that we just saw? Lorenzo de' Medici recognized his talent, invited him join, to join the art academy that Cosimo had founded, the first permanent painting school in history, and even invited Leonardo to live in the Medici Palace oops, excuse me, Michelangelo to live in the Medici Palace. When Savonarola's followers succeeded in banishing the Medici from Florence, Michelangelo traveled to Venice, Bologna, and finally to Rome, where he arrived at the age of 21 and would work for much of his life. So this is a good point to pause in my biography, if I can get my names right, to talk a little more about the Eternal City's revival. During the medieval period, Rome was basically a one-industry town, and the industry was the church. Most of its consumers, customers, were pilgrims. When the popes decamped to Avignon during much of the 14th century, Rome went into a steep decline. When the papacy returned permanently to Rome in the 15th century, a series of strong, if not especially spiritual, popes led a drive to rebuild the city and especially its religious buildings. These popes were heavily influenced by the Renaissance. The pope we will most concern ourselves with today, Julius II, was pope from 1503 to 1513, and he took that name to show his admiration of Julius Caesar, not, I think, a notable Christian saint. The drive to beautify and glorify Rome would acquire new urgency when Martin Luther began to challenge church authority, although, ironically, the crisis that provoked the Protestant Reformation was German objections to papal efforts to raise enough money to build St. Peter's by selling indulgences. So, art history is very much part of European history. At any rate, I'll talk about that in my final lecture for the unit. The College Board did not include any Michelangelo sculptures on its list. A little strange, because Michelangelo himself preferred sculpture to painting, and as we'll see, his Sistine Chapel paintings are required works that sometimes look a lot like sculptures. This work isn't in your textbook, but I've already shown it to you once when we looked at the Rotgen Pieta. I could imagine the College Board asking you to identify the name for this particular narrative, just as, as the Annunciation is when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary. Michelangelo sculpted this work for a cardinal, and it made him an instant superstar. The subject of Mary with her dead son had never been treated before in Italian sculpture, although it was a common theme in Northern Europe, where more emotional subjects were often popular. So just a few comments about this work, since we need to move on. Note that the defining shape of the composition is another pyramid. The curve of Christ's arm echoes the curve of the winding sheet, while his feet direct our eye up to Mary's ever-youthful face. The large swath of cloth was necessary to convincingly support the dead body of Christ, but note that Mary's body is really unrealistically wide also to support the body. Michelangelo does a good job with the clothing to disguise that. This, by the way, is the most finished sculpture that Michelangelo ever made, and it's the only one he ever signed. His signature is on the sash crossing Mary's breast. Michelangelo returned to Florence where he produced his iconic David. This statue is 16 and a half feet tall without the base. Like the Pietà, the David was instantly hailed as a masterpiece. In fact, the cathedral authorities actually convened a committee. It included Botticelli, Filippino Lippi, that was Fra Lippi's son, remember that naughty angel, and Leonardo da Vinci to decide where the statue should be placed. Leonardo wanted to put it in an obscure corner. He was apparently jealous of Michelangelo, who in turn, not entirely unfairly, accused him of not being able to finish any of his great ideas. 
Well, Leonardo lost that argument and the committee ultimately chose a spot beside the main entrance to the Piazza della Signoria uh, or the square in front of the town hall, where it stood until 1873 when it was removed to a museum for safekeeping. Now, Michelangelo's David is not on the list, but it's actually showed up in several of the recently released college board practice questions, so go figure. Michelangelo would have been very familiar with Donatello's work. And I really can't emphasize enough, this was a hothouse. These artists knew each other, they imitated each other, they envied each other, they interacted with each other. It is interrelated work. At any rate, how has, so, so he would have been familiar with Donatello's work, it had been produced 60 years earlier. How has he departed from Donatello's vision? Well, as I just said, Michelangelo's David is much larger, uh, really colossal in size. Both Davids are nude, but Michelangelo's sculpture didn't provoke the same unease as Botticelli's. It may be because at this point the Florentines were a whole lot more used to nudity. It also seems to me that Michelangelo's David doesn't have that disturbing pedophiliac undertone. Although the stance is superficially similar, Michelangelo has chosen a very different moment in the narrative. Not the moment of victory, but the moment when David winds up to fire his slingshot. So notice how one side of the body remains closed and relaxed, but the other is poised and tense, ready to spring. The body stands again in that resilient curve, like a strung bowstring. The hands and feet are oversized, which renders them more protective and more expressive. Remember that the statue is designed to be seen from below, and Michelangelo designed his David to focus our eye on the two elements of his victory. The head that came up with the plan, and the hand that executed the plan. So we have a brilliant brain directing a fit and agile body. This is the Renaissance ideal, and we're going to see it in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel paintings as well. And that brings us to the great drama of the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo left behind a detailed autobiography, so we have a blow-by-blow -blow account of his love-hate relationship with his most famous patron, told, of course, from Michelangelo's rather self-serving perspective. So let's watch a video clip that explores this famous partnership and feud. The video starts up after Julius II had canceled Michelangelo's contract to design his tomb and after Michelangelo had already embezzled the money and run off. The Pope asks the government of Florence to help get Michelangelo back to Rome. Michelangelo's words in the video actually come from his autobiography. So let's take a look at the final product and then go back to examine the pro process of painting the chapel. This virtual tour, which was produced by the Vatican, is very short, but it gives an overview, that is, if it works on the school computer. The Sistine Chapel is the private chapel of the Pope, located between the Papal Apartments and the Basilica of St. Peter's. It's here that the College of Cardinals meets to elect a new Pope. The chapel was built by Pope Sixtus IV, hence the name Sistine, in the late 15th century, but the original ceiling was simply blue with stars. The lower walls were decorated by a series of mostly Florentine artists. The end wall, which we see here, The Last Judgment, was also painted by Michelangelo, but much later, between 1535 and 1541. And as I said, we're going to discuss that work in more detail when we get to Mannerist art. Walking toward the altar, one passes from the life of Noah to the life of Adam to the creation of the world, a reverse sequence from the chronological one. The priest standing at the altar would, of course, see it in the right direction, but upside down. Either way, the compositional plan ensured that the expulsion from the Garden of Eden fell directly above the gate that separated the late laities and the priests sections of the chapel, and the creation falls directly above the altar. On the curved sides, in those triangles, Michelangelo painted sibyls, prophets, and ancestors of Christ. Everything that looks like architecture is an illusion, by the way. It's all painting. Back to process. As you saw from the earlier video clip, Michelangelo was terrified by the commission. He had not worked in fresco since he'd trained as a teenage apprentice 20 years earlier. The Pope, moreover, had suggested that he paint scenes from the New Testament. Michelangelo thought the Pope's plans lacked drama, and he persuaded Julius II to cover the ceiling with Old Testament narratives instead, again from creation through the flood and Noah's Ark. So now you're going to watch a few brief excerpts from a video that describes 
describes the process and the pain of painting the Sistine Chapel. Uh, it follows the efforts of two artists to replicate just one portion of it on the ceiling of a Catholic church in London. Uh, the actor playing Michelangelo again is reading from Michelangelo's autobiography. So the first clip talks about problems Michelangelo ran into producing his first panel, The Flood, which, as it happens, is the panel the College Board chose as its required work. The second clip describes the pain of producing the fresco standing on a scaffold with his neck craned up to work. Ouch. And the third talks about how Michelangelo set out to fix the problems he encountered painting the first half of the ceiling, including the flood. Okay, I admit, I'm puzzled by the College Board's decision to choose this as the one required Genesis panel. The flood was the first panel that Michelangelo painted, but as far as I can tell, historians pretty much agree it was also the worst panel that Michelangelo painted. Maybe that's why the College Board chose this work. How often do we get to critique an artist like Michelangelo? So what, aside from the overwet plaster, which Michelangelo mostly fixed uh, when an artillery shell was fired in the 18th century, another chunk fell out. But what is the problem with the composition? Well, mostly it was just too busy and too hard to see way up on the ceiling. So let's just compare it for a moment with the creation of Adam, which is widely viewed as the masterpiece among the Genesis panels. So what differences do you observe? Well, the creation panel is much simpler, but it's also more dynamic. The figures are large enough that we can make out facial expressions as well as the beautifully modeled musculature. Somehow the creation panel also seems to capture the Renaissance enterprise. Humans are being empowered to think, to create, and of course, also to sin and fall. God is the instrument, but man is God's creation, and in some ways his partner. Here again, as with his David, Michelangelo is all about the action that is about to happen. So we anticipate that in any moment, Adam is going to spring to life. In the flood, if anything, I think the male nudes or ignudi on the frame below the flood almost overpower the biblical story. They too easily draw our eye. But now that I've seized the rare opportunity to diss Michelangelo, let's try to see some of the strengths of the work. Here again, we detect Michelangelo's humanist agenda. He has not portrayed the soon-to-be-drowned humans as evil characters, even though we know they rebelled against God. These are real people. They're pleading for help. They're assisting each other. They're seeking shelter. And they're desperately hoping for rescue. Here we see a mother cradling a baby and trying to protect her child from the rain. We see a man carrying his wife. He hopes to safety. A boy climbing a tree. But of course, the only hope lies with that odd boxy arc at the back of the painting. So what is going to happen to the people raising the ladder to get in? Are they members of Noah's family? Will the ladder be pushed back as the ark sails? There's a lot of drama here. The second required image is one of the sibyls, which Michelangelo placed alongside the prophets because these Greek mythological seers were also thought to have foretold the birth of Christ. Again, we see the marriage of classical and Christian themes that is so characteristic of Michelangelo and of the Renaissance. The Delphic sibyl is the youngest and most beautiful of the sibyls. She presided over the Temple of Apollo in the Greek town of Delphi, where it was long customary for the priestess, or Pythia as she was called, to be a young woman selected from some family of poor country people. The Sybil is carefully, I would say really sculpturally composed. To achieve balance and space, Michelangelo makes the Sybil turn her limbs in one direction and the face and gaze in a countering direction and note the foreshortening of the elbow. While her upper body is mostly, I mean, her lower body is mostly static, her upper body is twisting, and you see that broad, sweeping, arching motion, which is in turn echoed by that open scroll and by the swollen cloak. Note that Michelangelo uses strong color contrast to draw our eye toward her twisting shoulder, while chiaroscuro and Trump Doyle architectural features enhance the sense of volume. Presumably, the prophetic scroll she's reading predicts the coming of Christ, so... Why doesn't she look happier about this? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe it's because the reign of Apollo is coming to an end. But there are other pictures of the same Sybil carrying a crown of thorns, which show us that she predicted the sufferings of Christ. So maybe that's the meaning of the sorrowful expression. So what else do you notice about Michelangelo's women? 
Looks a little like they're trying out for women's pro wrestling or maybe ingesting controlled substances. Really, all of Michelangelo's figures look a little like male statues. And we know he used male models for both men and women and that he was fascinated by the male nude. The Sistine Chapel also underwent a massive and, as always, controversial re restoration in the 1980s. Uh, it generally gets better reviews than the Last Supper re restoration, but it's still controversial. thought you might be interested in this before and after painting. The Delphic Sibyl is, was not as badly faded, by the way, as some of the frescoes. So now we need to be quick. Michelangelo framed the narrative scenes with 20 male nudes, or ignudi. Art historians still debate why Michelangelo placed them in the ceiling. Their religious purpose isn't clear. But they're clearly based on the Belvedere sculpture shown here, a Hellenistic sculpture from around 50 AD that was in the Vatican collection in which Michelangelo frequently studied. Michelangelo, by the way, was also on the scene when the Lacone was unveiled in Rome. Sister Wendy gives Michelangelo the benefit of the doubt. She thinks that Michelangelo set out to capture the Renaissance and Greek ideal of a fine mind and a fine body. But there's not much doubt that Michelangelo was fascinated by the beauty of male nudes. It's all over his autobiography and was apparently a rather prominent feature of his private life as well. Okay, I'm throwing this one in mostly because I like it, but also because Michelangelo juxtaposes prophets with sibyls and ancestors of Christ. Here we see the prophet Jeremiah. He is the ominous prophet who warned of the sorrow and oppression that must accompany salvation. Note how the figure pulls downward, and intriguingly, it's placed directly above the papal throne. So the prophet's sorrow is somehow the pope's sorrow. Remember, this was a painted at a time when the warrior pope Julius II was engaged in a life-and-death struggle with the king of France, who would invade Italy in 1492 and sack Rome in 15. Well, this may mark me as irredeemably weird or even weirder, but I'm going to end with what are my personal favorites among Michelangelo's works. These slaves were supposed to be part of Julius II's elaborate tomb. That's the contract he canceled. But remember, too, what Michelangelo believed about the artist's role. He thought that he was, his job was to recognize and to liberate a sculpture that to his mind was already, already struggling to be free from stone. I love that these figures are still somewhat bound to the stone. We never entirely go free. But you're free to say farewell to Michelangelo for now because we're going to move on to our last two superstars, Raphael and Titian.